It's okay. Hi, welcome to the Austin Software Cooperatives Meetup. Today is Wednesday, October 3rd. We'll be doing a book review on the surprising power of liberating structures. This is a paperback, not yet available in Audible. It was published in 2014, and it's available in Kindle and paperback versions on Amazon.com. Uh, we'll go over a mind map about the book, just a quick overview of the book and the concepts. We'll have an open discussion. This meetup is every month. The next meetup will be on Wednesday, November 5th. We'll gather topic ideas for that meetup so we can plan what we want to discuss next time. Taylor will go over a little bit about when we all vote and we have some ways to stay connected with the group after today's meetup. This meetup is being recorded and is on the Volk Co-op YouTube page. Cool, so surprising power of liberating structures. Go into our mind map here. The basic concept of this book is that meetings are boring, unproductive, and frustrating to attendees. And that stifles creativity and innovation. And the surprising power of liberating structures, the goal is to improve performance of teams by replacing these conventional methods with a more liberating structure, of which there are 33 in this book. We'll go over our favorite ones today and we'll provide links on the other ones in case you want to dig into it a little bit deeper later. Another goal of Liberating Structures is to make it possible for everyone to be included, engaged, and unleashed in solving problems, innovating, and achieving great outcomes. So I think I'll start over here on the right side, the problems that we're trying to solve with this book. The five common elements of control in conventional and liberating structures, so both what people do now that aren't working and what this book proposes to be the way forward, you need to make an invitation to the participants, arrange the space, either a Zoom, a Google Hangout, an actual office or a classroom, distribute the participation, let people know in advance who's going to be presenting or able to participate in the meeting, configuring groups, and then outlining the sequence of steps and time allocation. The five conventional ways people work together, which is also called the big five in this book, which we know that to mean other things in other contexts, but in this book they call it the big five. Presentation, like we're having now, a managed discussion, um, like we do often when we have an agenda, agenda bashing and everyone can contribute, a status report, which you typically would do if you're consulting with your clients, and open discussion, which um, can just be really open and go into chaos, and brainstorming. This book contends that these methods are seen as restricting, oppressive, and top-down flow of information as they don't include everyone to um, engage. And they have some examples of conventional methods, uh, presentation. So if we look at the five, sh the five common elements, the invitation space, participation, configuration of groups, and sequence of steps, each one of these is sort of outlined. So with the presentation and status report, an audience is invited to listen, not really participate. One expert or one person is in the spotlight. One person dominates 90 to 90 percent of the time, 90 to 99 percent of the time. And the presentation is the first and biggest step, gets most of the time. And then Q&A, if there's even time, is the second step and gets a very small amount of time. So there's too much control, no structure to include or engage other people in the room in the meeting. 
And because of that, it can spark defensiveness, even withdrawal or resistance from the people listening who don't have a say. And it can also just be passive acceptance where they're like, well, you're going to say and do whatever you want. And I don't even get a chance to talk. So fine, go for it. Um, open discussion. People are invited to respond to a topic. Each uh, attendee could have a microphone, but there's no distribute distribution of participation. It's just kind of free flowing ideas. And there's too little control for this one. So it can turn into chaos, difficult to shape next steps, and usually ends up with an authority figure stepping in to manage the discussion or shutting it down. And then a managed discussion. A person in power asks participants to respond to a specific question. So there's one leader in control. The others are watching the authority figure. And participation is basically distributed by the person in power. So this is like a classroom where there's a teacher standing at the front and they call on people if the people don't raise their hand. Even when they raise their hand, the person in front of the room decides. So there's too much centralized control with that one entirely of the hands of the person in power. And uh, they say it's challenging to make it a safe space for everyone to speak up. And senior leaders or extroverts are more likely to express their opinions and it can lead to top-down decisions. So those are sort of the things this book is looking to change. As I go on this participation, uh, this presentation, does anyone have any comments on that part <clears throat> before we go on? Um, passive acceptance, there's another corollary with that one passive resistance, so implicit in any type of, um, I guess, engagement strategy is um, trying to avoid passive resistance. You're trying to get more people to be engaged, and it's very powerful. Well, passive resistance is really is a really powerful thing, so when you have a, a group and you're trying to do top-down strategy, basically smart person on top, everyone else underneath listening and trying to get buy-in, which it doesn't. The resistance that comes through is um, overwhelming. So I don't know if we're going to save the critique for the end or we can do critique right on through, but I got not really a critique. I got a critique for the book, not that it's wrong, but there's some implicit things that we have to keep in mind when we're deploying these strategies, I think they work. But there's something, there's some other things that we probably want to talk about with them. Things that we we always talk about with, with this when it comes to fairness and things like that. But that's it. Thank you. All right, let's go into the goal of these liberating structures. So the goal is to improve performance of teams by replacing those conventional methods, the presentation, uh, the status report, etc., with these liberating structures and to make it possible for everyone to be included, engaged, unleashed. And yes, we do want to think about fairness. We also think a great deal about how do folks best interact and how do they prefer to engage. So I think that even regardless of which liberating structure we may choose to try out first, I think there will be other things to consider in addition to what is outlined here in this book. Especially because this book seems to focus on face-to-face. And we're rarely face to face. We rely a lot on virtual tools like Slack and Zoom and Google Hangouts. So we would have to learn how to modify these ideas <laughs> to fit. But they say that the liberating structures allow accommodation of groups of any size, letting go of control safely giving everyone an equal opportunity to contribute, maximize active participation
expectation and routinely generate better than expected results. It challenges the myth that engaging people is difficult and says that you can radiate change in all directions, one-to-one, -one, group team, the whole organization, and out into your community. There's 33 liberating structures in this book, and this book also has an online um, component to it. So you can go to liberatingstructures.com slash ls dash menu, and you can see all 33 of these structures. And there's 33, so it's hard to digest all 33 at once, and this, you can't use all 33 at one time unless you have a very... Uh, complicated storyboard, which we'll get into. So it says just start by learning and using one. And any liberating structure is better than a conventional approach. So we'll see. We'll see about that. The next it are some principles and practices of liberating structures. There's 10 of them. <laughs> to include everyone, have deep respect for people and solutions, never start without a clear purpose. Build trust as you go and learn by falling forward. Practice self-discovery within the group. Amplify freedom and responsibility. Believe before you see, so a little leap of faith. And creative destruction to make space for innovation and engage in seriously playful curiosity. So, yes. Self-discovery is the job for leaders is to remove obstacles and create conditions for self-discovery and co-creation for the folks on the front lines. So it tries to take away that top down. The leaders are forcing everyone to do this and the leaders are telling the front lines how it went. They want to include someone and people from every part of the organization. So if you had customer service, marketing, sales, engineering, CEO, they want someone on every level to participate versus the folks on the top telling the folks on the front lines what to do when the folks on the front lines have a different perspective and different information by being there every day. Uh, they say that this should also boost inclusion and engagement, or what they call the IE quotient. And they quoted a study that said 70% of American workers are not engaged in their work, and 18% of that are actively resisting the goals of the organization. So like what Watson was saying, it's active mm. resistance, mm. not just passive. <laughs> mm. And using these liberating structures is a focus on changing habits. So changing and improving routine practices, behaviors, and patterns of interaction, starting on the front line with support and participation of the leaders. Say they're easy to learn, but the use requires breaking long with standing habits. Hmm. And we find that. We have meetings every day, and we have them the same way every day. And in some ways, some meetings, I think benefit from that but when we're trying to get new ideas and spark creativity a different format seems to be useful there um so with liberating structures they want everyone to start on equal footing no waiting around for permission from leaders and the front lines and even customers can participate together and that just helps get a diverse um, group of ideas There's common goals for groups, discovering everyday solutions, so problem solving and coordination in meetings, interactions, noticing patterns, looking for ways to explain or make sense of changes, unleashing local actions that get each person engaged in taking action, drawing out prototypes, so quickly developing small solutions that can be refined later, and then spreading innovation, so spreading ideas out and scaling it outward. And to get started with liberating structures is to select the best one that matches the group's main goal for the problem at hand. And we can take a look 
at the pathways, the fluency, which is basically don't try to convince folks, just use one in a meeting and let people experience it and let people discover and convince themselves of the value of these. So that's pretty interesting. I'm going to try to open up this link for pathways to fluency. Nope. Yeah, so <laughs> Pathways to Fluency, if we were a senior leader, you could have an immersion workshop, which this is just a book review or an intro. If we decide that any of these are worth digging in, then maybe we can have a workshop at a later time. And if you're not a leader and you're just a, a, you're a manager, an individual contrib contributor or solo practitioner, you can try one of the basic structures like the one, two, four, all or TRIZ, which we can go into what those mean and just your routine work. So you can just try to have a meeting and ask folks to participate in this way. So there's 33 of these structures and they can be used one at a time. They can also be used as a string. So you can use more than one at a time to meet your goal and they call that composing. So it's kind of like writing a song, I guess. You can look at the problem that you have at hand, the different parts of the problem, and then see which one of these structures or ways to communicate will fit. You'll start with the, a few questions, like what are you trying to accomplish? Why is it important? Why, why, why? And is the true purpose and need for the work clear? And who is going to be affected? So we do this when we're planning a feature. We want to know who the audience is. We want to know what the goals are going to be, the outcome. What's the business value? Why do we need to do it? And they had some examples of why you would use strings. So there's everyday solutions, like the meetings aren't inspiring, people spend too much time presenting than doing, and there's no buy-in for top-down initiatives, and they had some ideas on which strings you would use in that situation. There's noticing patterns. If you have members of your group that are cynical, people can't see positive change, they're stuck in a rut, or expectations are thrown off, there's a set of strings, a set of structures you can use to try to get to the bottom of that for prototyping, for unleashing action, for spreading innovation, there's some sample strings. So I'll open up the sample strings and then if anyone has any ideas or thoughts about stringing these structures together, I welcome your input. I, some of the things that we, that we're dealing with, with like, say, the um, Kubernetes community, if you scroll back up to the sure. top, where they got, where they act, that right there. Yeah. <clears throat> I just immediately thought of the Cloud Native Foundation and Kubernetes. It'd be interesting to, the way that they set everything up, you've got the uh, the TLC, right, and then which is kind of like this overarching committee, and then you've got working groups, and um, what is it, special interest groups. This almost seems like if you were starting from scratch, right. Kubernetes is kind of cheating because they were ripping it from Borg, I believe. 
an internal project from Google. Not saying that that's bad, but it'd be interesting to start from scratch and try to string some things together with using some of these techniques. Uh, that's what I thought of when I saw this. It's kind of hard to talk about the strings before talking about the individual components first, but you've got the like chicken and egg situation. So it's basically <clears throat> stringing together the other structures. So when you're talking about Kubernetes as an example, are you referring to stuff like the special interest groups and mm -hmm. other um, little groups that get together and and the foundation itself is made of lots of little groups where they have to do governance. Yeah. And different meetings are going to run in different ways. You have to figure out the features, mm -hmm. like the product planning side and the, str the strategy side. It would be interesting to pay attention to that. So it's Kubernetes essentially versus OpenStack. So how do you beat OpenStack? I think they want to do that or make OpenStack do what you want it to do, either one. So there's strategy involved. These, these special interest groups and working groups and all that stuff, be interesting to replace it with some of these or to think of those in this, in a lot of these structures. How you could run them more efficiently, maybe? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I mean, what problems do you want to solve? You want to create features. Mm -hmm. You want to prioritize. That's always hard. Right. And then the strategy part. I don't really think top down is still like really decisively better at this point when I'm thinking about strategy. When you're talking about large groups, flat hierarchy, um, and you're trying to get those groups to think about another group, most likely a group that's a, a top down. It's it's interesting to try to solve that problem, and then saying trying to bring out some of these structures to try to get every, people to try to compete. It's interesting to try to do that. And that's all. I agree that it <laughs> it was challenging to write about strings and storyboards before understanding all of the liberating structures. I think if I had to read this book again, I would read it backwards because that's how I wanted. I wanted to know what the structures were and I wanted to know what they did. And that's at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no way to win. There's a popular software book by Byron Fowler. All of his books are in this in this method. The patterns community. So there are patterns that pop up in all programming languages to solve programming problems. And the second half of the book is the patterns. And they give you the examples in like Java or Ruby or something. But the first half of the book sets you up for the second half of the book. So the first half of the book, it says, yeah, refer to pattern six, which is active record, which three of you will be familiar with. But you don't know what active record is yet until you go, you know, so it's a chicken and egg <laughs> problem. That's what I was saying. Even with the strings, it's a chicken and egg. I don't know how, to, how you would formulate it. Because you can't get the interest in it when you just put the reference material right in the beginning. You know, you've got to memorize these 40 things or 50 things or whatever, and they build up interest with the first half of the book. So I, I see what their problem is. Um, <laughs> on to the other issue. We'll get into the examples in just a second. So there's, you can use one at a time, you can string them. And then there's storyboarding, which is even more comprehensive. 
sort of sophisticated design of strings and structures linked together in a logical progression. So you can have this if you're launching a multi-stakeholder collaborative project. So a kickoff of a project that seems you could use storyboards, developing the strategy and building new leadership team. Again, that seems like it's at the beginning of something where you could use those advancing a board movement across many regions at a summit that might not be at the beginning of something but sort of a reset there's some sample storyboards um, there at the liberating structures but again let's go into some of the details so that we understand what they're stringing together uh, how to compose preparation clarify the purpose by asking why and finding out which structure fits the challenge, what insights or outcomes might emerge, what's made possible now, and what next step will build momentum and a shared understanding and then repeating those steps. Now we'll get to the part where I wanted to start. <laughs> a few examples of liberating structures of the 33 in the book and also at liberatingstructures.com. So the first one they listed and said was sort of the most common or basic is called one, two, four, all. And the invitation is sent to participants to reflect and share suggestions in response to an idea. So they know what the topic will be and they'll have time to reflect on it. This is a face to face structure. So it would need work to translate into virtual. If you're in a group in a room, you'll have folks sit in groups of two and then in groups of four. And everyone's given equal time. The timeline of this event is pretty short. So you have one minute. Each person will reflect alone and write down their ideas on that topic or idea. And then they'll join one other person and meet in pairs for two minutes and share their ideas. Then they'll join groups of four for two more minutes and share their ideas. And then in the next three minutes, one group at a time will share one idea with the entire room. So that's a way for every voice to be heard and everyone to get equal time to think about and share their ideas. They claim it provides a safe space for more timid and prevents more vocal people from monopolizing the meeting because it is time boxed. And it encourages candid exchanges and listening in those one-on-one -on -one small, small groups. So those are the benefits and a con that I thought, well, how would that be handled virtually if we're not face-to-face? -face? Do we set up like seven different Zoom chats and then have people dial into the next one or rely on Slack? And we'll have to figure that out if this one is even possible to do virtually. And some of the benefits or some of the things that were cool about this one is that it transforms discussions from a linear sequence of single contributions. So 16 people going one after another to give their ideas or 16 people coming up with their ideas at the same time um, simultaneously. You can get wide and diverse contributions and shared ownership of co-developed initiatives. So since everybody was in, um, everyone was engaged from the beginning and had their ideas expressed and heard, there should be less time needed for buy-in, convincing, or explanations because everybody was there in the room at that time. There's distributed control and it maximizes the allotted time. Parallel processing can be scaled to include more stakeholders, equal time to participate, clear boundaries with the time boxing, and safe spaces to minimize power dynamics. So that one's called one, two, four, all. Hmm. I can imagine being in that room, though, and it would be really loud. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are a couple goals that are served with all of these structures. With like what you said, referencing things would be loud. 
-hmm. one of the things when you're trying to flatten a hierarchy is you're trying to get people to communicate more and present more um, and not be passive and just take strategic direction from on top and try to get people to direct more or be involved with the direction of whatever initiative, business or whatever that you're dealing with. So a lot of these structures are also practice. There's the, the end goal of the structure, but there's the practice of trying to deal with an environment where you're, everything is flat. So you, you have to get used to, there's that, there's audible noise, but there's also the problem of information. You could say information overload coming from different directions. So not necessarily audible noise, but it could be noise from Slack or other places. And you're having to figure out how to filter in these types of flatter hierarchies. How do you deal with that kind of stuff? And this is, these structures would make you, force you to practice that. Which uh, which liberating structure would you really like to look at next? Min specs. Thought min spec was Taylor. Let's take a look. Yeah. I'm gonna go to the liberating structures dot sure. com ls menu and number fourteen is min specs. Okay, I'll paste it to the chat as well. It has a mushroom as it's. It's a mushroom. It's perfect. Yeah. What are your thoughts on min specs? So, um, I, I think this, I your thing. this one's, mm -hmm. I think, pretty, maybe, maybe because it is my thing, I guess. Um, <laughs> it feels pretty straightforward. <laughs> this one feels more intuitive than some. Um, so the brief overview is <clears throat> come up with all of the ideas and um, features or whatever to get to some goal. So if you or if if you have a product or a feature that you're coming up with, have everyone. Um, give their ideas, um, give a time for them all to put them in. So now you have the maximum specs, the max specs is what it talks about. And then you start cutting them out after that. <clears throat> There's, it gives a time period for all of that. So everyone has their input on how to make it happen. And then you start cutting those um, away by asking if we don't have this one part, this item or whatever, um, to get to the end goal, would it kill the product or the feature or whatever we're trying to get to? <clears throat> and if not, then you can cut it. And you just keep doing that until you end up with the smallest um, set possible um, and going around. So, um, you're able to have time to discuss those as you're going around. So someone said, we really need it for this reason, that sort of thing. So you're going to have participation from everybody at the start, as well as folks who <clears throat> like to sit back and think about things. And I think there was a part that talked about you can have another iteration even. So you're like, okay, we're good and we're go going along here. You can have like a final iteration or maybe it's as you're moving along in the product or whatever and cut something up. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I like the idea of being able to potentially show all the options and then still cut them down. So that's, you know, you get both sides. <laughs> and that's good. Yeah, I was saying... The part with the sequence of steps, 
generate a list of must do's. Yeah. That part is where it's like, oh yeah, Taylor would say, well, you don't have to do that part. Here's context where you wouldn't have to do that. And mm -hmm. That's why I was thinking it would be pretty good to do this one. To get to that. <laughs> probably could really come up with a main space. Yeah. And, the, and then people actually feel okay. You have potentially less pushback whenever you start with the big list and then you work your way down and why you're able to cut it out or not. Yeah, I was thinking of this when I was going through this one. I was thinking that whole, what is it, the um, 15 factors or whatever it is. Or then, like the network service mesh or anything, like how you would come up with that's a mint spec. Like a 12, the 12, 12 factor app? Okay. Yeah, 12 factor app. Yeah, 12 factor app. Yeah. You could do this process and help with that. This one can help get to the MVP or the minimum viable product too. Mm -hmm. If you say, oh, I need. Dropbox, it needs to build a Dropbox, and it needs to have all of these things. Mm -hmm. And then, well, maybe we haven't asked, or maybe we haven't asked in a while, or it's really good to ask. If we don't do this one, can we still deploy a Dropbox yeah. mm -hmm. to the internet? Yeah, but it would be as nice. Yeah, but can people use it? Yeah. Yes. So mm -hmm. uh, this one's a good one. I, I, yeah, I really like that, which your example, dealing with external. You Internally, we may be like, okay, we already know the space enough. We'll just cut features immediately. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you could be wrong. So that's still like maybe we missed something that we should actually have. But maybe if you know it well, you're going to do good. When you go out and talk with someone else and you just say, give me the minimal stuff. And then they're immediately like, well, I need it all. Mm -hmm. So this allows you to go, tell me everything you want, if, if that's what you need. Mm -hmm. And you just let them list it all, and then then you can start helping them. Yeah. And that seems an easier path. The thing that came up also for me was doing this. You've got an audience. You have a customer, mm -hmm. and it ends up, you need to know a customer profile mm -hmm. for the features you're coming up that you're serving. We've got the people that have no money, and they're probably going to be the most difficult and require the most specifications or whatever. And then you've got to make a decision on no, not them. And then you're, you probably will have better minimum specifications. So it ends up being like this might force you to think about your customer more and say, make a decision on like you get, oh, we have not a 12 factor app, we have a 50 factor. Oh, but these people aren't paying us anyway, so. They can afford a one factor app, force you. which is not, <laughs> get rid of not them. won't allow you to even get a section. Yeah. Cool, that was a good example. <sighs> which one would you like to talk about next? Troika Consulting, Wicked Questions, Wise Crowds, Nine Wise. I think the Troika one was the one that Which one? jumped out at me. Number eight, Troika Consulting. Troika. Okay. So I'll just go straight to, oh, also, I think the, a good way to look at these structures is description, the invitation, the structure invitation, structuring invitation and the um, the steps and then the rest is like gravy but um but this one and there was another consulting book I was reading recently there's a part in here that hit on for me where it's getting people to practice asking like clarifying questions or describing the problem. And I just thought that that was 
a good practice. So um, if you scroll down maybe to the steps. Invite participants to reflect on a consulting question. So you've got just the background. You've got a, you've split off into groups. You've got one client. They come up with a problem statement or something like that. And then you have the rest of the group. And so invite our participants to reflect on a consulting question. The groups uh, have uh, first client share his or her question. Consultant, consultants ask the client clarifying questions, that one. So clarifying questions and then describing the problem. In this other book I was reading, it was like consulting or helping someone, a big part of it is just describing the problem. The customer or client wouldn't need you if they already knew what the problem was. You describe it differently than them. So there's a battle there. And I think this gets you to practice that kind of thing. So um, there's a, a top down. Again, it, it rolls into that top down idea. Having your client be the top down. Like, oh, I already know what the problem is. You need to do X, Y, Z. And the person that's the consultant is the person that says, actually, it's not X, Y, and Z. It's A, B, and C. And the battle is won and law or lost there even before the implementation. And so practicing that type of thing somehow tactfully, forcefully trying to describe a problem differently than what the principal, the person asking you to do work, is how they are describing it, is I think is important. So this thing is addressing that. Yeah, I really like this one. That seems like a one that would need practice to feel comfortable doing because oh, yeah. their the habit is okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a reason why consultants make more money than yes. <laughs> people who just do what they're told because it's freaking hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's see let's go over wicked questions i like the idea of we could create well <clears throat> strings but um even beyond that i think there's probably a set of structures that are directly applicable for us yeah. as a software consulting company um and then there's probably other structures that are likewise good as a cooperative for governance. Um, this one and the men, the men actually I think is good both ways, but the, the, this, this one, the Troca consulting and the men are direct outside, which mm -hmm. would, mm -hmm. we were looking, which, how can we apply some of these? Like mm -hmm. What would be, Good. So that might be a way to do it. We look at a, a list and go, let's focus on this set. Because there's, what, 33? Mm -hmm. That's by the way, seems a little overwhelming. Makes me think of the power, was it power negotiating with personality types, or it's like there's only these sets. There's four, yeah. Yeah, here's the four. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's me saying that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were good, though. I didn't really come across one where I said, this is garbage, get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. So this one is one of my favorite ones. It probably would be good. Like, would you just clarify internal? It would be pretty tough to do it external. The truck at consulting? No, wicked wicked question. Oh, wicked. Oh, what you have on the screen. Yes, wicked question. This one is finding a well, I can let you if you want to do it. 
Find the paradox when you want. Pop out of that. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of so a paradox is not a contradiction. A paradox is something that seems like it's impossible for both halves to be true, but it's not actually where both halves are mutually exclusive. Um, so identifying those, and I love the quote at the top where it's Niels Bohr. Oh, we found a paradox. Now we can actually get somewhere. We can make some progress. So, <laughs> um, so it's 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 getting it's cutting straight to the the hard problem and creating the or identifying the dilemma, and then um, trying to move forward from there. So like that one right there, where it says, introduce a concept of wicked questions and the paradox. Illustrate with a couple examples. Use the template. How is it that we are and we are simultaneously? As a sentence to complete inserting two opposite strategies. So this is the kind of thing that people do all the time. But it's like the cynical people. So you're bringing them in and engaging them. And then you're going to do a little okie doke later and say, now solve it. So it's good. Yeah, I can think of some internal ones we can do with that one. They're not going to be easy. <laughs> yeah, the political side, it, I think that's the one where they say they had some good advice in there where you have to frame it in such a way to where it's not aggressive. Express both sides in an appreciative in an appreciative form. Yeah, and they had something in there where it said, "Not in opposition." How to do it? I think this is the one. Oh, oh, it that was it. You just said it. It said avoid. Avoid. I think it's tips. Whatever you want. avoid. Nasty. Question. Avoid nasty questions. Nasty. <laughs> <laughs> that a point blame. Okay, so avoid pointing blame. An example of a nasty question. How can we focus on our customers when we are forced to spend more and more time on foolishness? <laughs> <laughs> I like to avoid data questions that can be answered with more analysis. That's good too. That sounds like something. Logic, this could be answered if you want to. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we, we need to not have this. So, so, those are good examples. Is is this one like a, a very specific form of the truck consulting where we're trying to, if, if you're looking at externally or you're looking at trying to help, so you're you were saying. Someone has a problem and you're trying to rephrase it in a way, look at it a different way and communicate to it. And this seems like a very specific form of that where you could actually communicate about a, a paradox that could be a problem. This is the one that is, like if you, I think it's either in the riffs or in the whys. Mm -hmm. Like if you go to the whys, this is the one that basically the managers don't want to. Like you're not, these, this is makes explicit the elephants, not the nine wise. I'm sorry, the the, the why know, the purpose of, of the, the four wicked question. Yeah. question. It is, um, I believe, it's the one where they say the elephant in the room. Da, da, da. Oh, well, so one. that so no. Okay. It Describe, messy reality. Yeah, so yeah, messy that. Reality. Okay. I just translate this stuff into my own. <laughs> messy reality <laughs> of this, this situation, right? So, so, do, so if there's, I guess my point would be, um, maybe okay, maybe I should rethink this. So, maybe it's 
you need to identify whether the problem is something that needs to be rephrased or communicated in a different way, or the problem is, oh, it's a mess of reality. So it's not just rephasing. They may be avoiding it entirely because it's messy. So then how do you deal with that? It, this to me is something that does happen with customers. So internally it can be hard enough. You have all sorts of things um, happening, but when you're dealing with a, an external party, a client or customer, you can have something where they're trying to do something and the reality is what they're doing is a problem in and of itself. It's not even like if they know it better. Let me tell you why I like this one. <laughs> in philosophy, there is a, they like paradoxes for this reason. Like when someone comes up, like when it said earlier, Niels Bohr, so they're talking, that's quantum physics. That's the quantum physics. Right. Right. Um, in philosophy, they like paradoxes because it, it's like a, they're, uh, they are like uh, guardrails. So there's one, a famous one, when you talk about time, the Taggart's, Nick Taggart's paradox. You can either believe that time is real or that it's an illusion, essentially, I'm paraphrasing. And, but when you don't, you become, it's not a paradox, it's a contradiction. And you'll say things like, for instance, there's people who can believe that the past actually exists, or you can believe that the past doesn't exist. But those are your two options. You can't do anything else. And this guy was exploring, he's trying to prove that time is an illusion, but he came up with this paradox. After he came up with that, like 100 years ago, then everybody, when they talk about time within philosophy, they use that as the guardrail. Like, oh, you tripped on the Taggart's uh, paradox or really contradiction. So, no, you're, what you're saying is like completely broken. When you come up with a strong paradox, like what Niels Bohr was you know, alluding to, now you have your guardrails. So that's really what they're trying to do. So it's very powerful. It's not just, you know, like a little rinky dink thing, but it's okay. for people who really, for a real problem that you maybe, like it's within your domain, like within software. And um, like for us, within software that we've been dealing with all our lives. And you, it's oh, okay. The, the new people are tripping over the paradox. They're, they're on one horn of the dilemma or whatever. That's really what it's getting is trying to get you to have guardrails so that you can all reason together. Can you go down to the example section? No, no quick fixes. So they, no quick fixes. <laughs> so then, um, okay, so going along with what you're saying, it sounds like if we were looking at a paradox for us, it would be better to imply it internally for an area that we know. So software would be one. Um, maybe funner and more interesting for us would be a cooperative. This very first one probably could be applied. So how is it that you are raising your, you have individuals or cooperative members that you want to be loyal to the cooperative and also and attach, but then also independent individuals, so autonomous and individual. We talk about a lot of that in the collaboration. Mm -hmm. So that part of being a co-op seems part of this, the collective. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this one's interesting. Mm -hmm. Sounds more, it sounds easier to talk about it from a philo <laughs> philosophical standpoint than trying to go through the, yeah. how do we actually fit? I think mm. we, you, it's, you can come up with them for our day to day. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to formulate them in a way where it's not aggressive and political, that would be a challenge. Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have the nine whys on here? I did. Isn't it interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one's. I think we've got uh, always good. We've got maybe ten minutes. Yeah. So there are other examples here. Liberatingstructures.com. Go under LS menu, and you'll find the thirty-three. So what? Now what? <laughs> <laughs> and then I had a question about well, how could we use some of these for virtual meetings? And I was able to find on the Liberating Structures website, they had like a small hyperlink on how you could do this virtually. But first, there's a checklist to make sure it makes sense and will be rewarding <laughs> and not frustrating for everybody involved. So for effective liberated virtual meetings, they ask yes or no question. If it's yes, you can proceed or proceed with abandon. If it's no, then think about what you need to do. So if you're trying to develop solutions, action plans, you want to, or no, <laughs> if you don't want to develop solutions or action plans, then reconsider why you're meeting and dig deeper into what you need from participants to make any progress at all. And using interactive virtual technology for sharing information is reliably unrewarding for all. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So unless you're wanting <laughs> participants to shape your next steps, then probably don't try to have one. Uh -huh. And it says, will the content or new information be provided 24 hours in advance? No, don't waste the group time reviewing homework. Set the firm expectation that everyone should come prepared and honor the participants by giving them enough prep time. So oops. I appreciate that. Have you drafted the questions or themes to be explored? No, without preparation, it'll be much more difficult to include everyone, spark creative participation, parse I can't read that word for some reason, and generate better than expected results. Um, yeah. <laughs> so here's a little checklist. Should you have a virtual meeting, yes or no? And if your answers are no, then maybe do a, a little bit more uh, planning before you invite folks so that it is a productive use of time. That's good. Oh, yes, proceed. Yes, proceed. Yes, proceed. <laughs> yeah, we can turn that into a Google form. Thanks, everyone, for um, participating in the surprising power of liberating structures and going through the review of some of those structures and how they're used and what they are trying to solve. Does anyone else have any comments or suggestions about this book and before we talk about our next meetup and some topic ideas for next time. Critique time. Critique time. Yeah. A reoccurring theme with productivity, how to get your workers to be more productive, is to have all of these strategies for getting people to engage more and then you no know, mention of oh yeah you're becoming more productive you should get paid more or you should own more so these all my point being these are not inherently morally good even though they look like it in the the structure is like, oh, we're all happy now, we're being engaged, um, everything like that. It's not. Any strategy for getting you to be more productive also needs to be coupled with some type of discussion about the surplus, how it is that you have some vote, some input on where the profit is going. Otherwise, it is exploitation. So that's all.
to say it another way or to make sure I understand, do you feel that large corporations will leverage these structures to make it seem like yeah. everyone's in this together? Only yeah. the frontline people, even though they will become more productive and contribute greatly to the success of the company, yeah. they'll still be making. Yeah, we've got yeah. Bill Gates loving this book, saying this is great, <laughs> and he's notorious for being top down, hating open source and all that. And then now it's changes soon. Well, why? It's not because he's trying to give, you know, spread wealth or anything. It's because it's a more effective way to harvest people's ideas so now it's more totalitarian before it was we control your body and get to being a code monkey now we control your ideas and your mind let's let's have those too so it's our our discussion about what a harvestocracy is so yeah he's all about it <laughs> You're right. It's right there on the on the cover. What is it? <laughs> What's on the cover? Uh, someone from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Oh yeah. Said that it's great. Yeah, he loves it. <laughs> they all love it. The CNCF loves it. Everybody loves it. And you get more and more people to contribute. Um, it can be used for good or for or for evil, whatever. It's not necessarily ethical, is my point. So, any other critiques? Mm. They, um, I don't know, that's hard to follow up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the one of the very first things that, that got me that um, s someone else's best practices imposed. So this was talking about like how to, why you would use this versus going with your traditional stuff. It seems like you could get into the, you could think that you're offering innovative ways to interact and all of that and that's your goal and then end up still with routines so um, that's partly why i was talking about having like a specific set but i do like i like the idea of being able to layer anyways cool i found this book on the Agile Austin book club list. I had not heard of it prior to last month. And so it seemed like an interesting thing to review. Uh, I'm interested in trying out some internally to see how it changes the way we think about our cooperative to start. And then if we find that one or more of these structures could be useful on a consulting or with our customer level, then perhaps it could be useful. We shall see. Watson, um, I've found some of the structures, the wording to be extra. Like it felt like using special words or names rather than just saying what it meant. Um, I think one thing that we thought um, I was thinking as well was like some of the whole structure of the book seem like a commercial for mm. a product. Um, specifically the, the structures. So I don't know if you saw that. Um, I, I honestly didn't get through all of it. So maybe it all comes together. But it seemed like there was some extra wording and stuff, you know, like I know you do some philosophy, a lot of philosophy reading. So specifically, if I thought like Zizek, <laughs> you would, there's some stuff that's so dense. Um, it's dense because there is a lot of content. Some of the structures felt more dense than necessary. Did you find that? I thought the first half of this book was written for hippies. It's written to try to pull people like, yes, 
your intuition mm -hmm. was right. <laughs> <laughs> we can all get together and it will just work. Here's some tools for you. And okay. so giving examples and then um, kind of trying to use rhetoric. So um, that's what I found in the first half to be like, but I didn't find it to be poorly written for that audience. It's just everything that you read for this stuff is going to be like that. Yeah. All of it. So I'm just used to it. Yeah, I thought it sort of read like an infomercial, which is like, these will solve your communication problems. Sound too good to be true? It's not. Go to, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. go to chapter seven to learn more about our 33 liberating structures over and over and over. That's yeah. why I was getting frustrated. I was like, just, I want to just read about them so I can learn about them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, our next meetup will be on Wednesday, November 7th, 7 p.m. Central Time. What would you like to discuss? We do have the opportunity to submit a CFP on a cooperative workshop this month. And so if we wanted to tie that in with the next month's uh, meetup. Good idea. I think we should do that. We can do that. The fairness one is what everybody asked for. Okay. It needs to be done by Friday, though. Yeah. But if we have... Snapchat. Cool. Uh, it seems the November meetup may conflict with an event. Do we want to stop this? Sure. Okay.